I'm here to tell you a story, and it's a scary story, but it might just save you from yourself. So listen very carefully. And because it's a scary story, we need to start in the dark. So close your eyes, cover them tight, and I want you to now drift back to your earliest memory of robots. Open your eyes. I wonder how many of you had an image like this one. This was my first experience of a robot. It was a Christmas day many, many years ago, and as I put my hand into the sack that Santa had left at the end of my bed, I pulled out this robot. I was both intrigued and terrified at the same time as the robot clanked towards me, sparks flicking across its head. Now, from our very earliest times as individuals and indeed as societies, perhaps we knew this day would come when robots took all our jobs, leaving us with only the jobs that we thought that robots would be doing for us. Perhaps we always knew in the evolution from sliver to stand that one day robots would outpace us and outsmart us. Perhaps we even knew that one day we would be no longer the most heavenly of creations. Now when we worry about something coming to get us, we also ima we often imagine that it's coming from out of space, something sci-fi. But you know, for generations, for centuries, we've been creating their own downfall. So here's an example. It's uh, Leonardo da Vinci's robotic suit, a fighting armor. Or jump forward to the early 20th century, and here's another robot. This is Eric. Eric's a conference speaker. And the story goes that the King of England was meant to give a talk at a conference, but couldn't turn up. I guess he was busy. So the conference organizers created Eric, and Eric robotically delivered the King's speech. Ooh, can you imagine, if the King of England's job is on the line, we've all got to be very, very afraid. In literature, of course, perhaps one of the most famous creations is Frankenstein's monster. And what happened when Frankenstein's monster got off the bed and went out into the street? Well, the people didn't like it, did they? and they chased away this monster with pitchforks and torches. I wonder how long it will be until we push away AI and robots, not wanting them in our lives. Talking about uh, creation, uh, another creation story, of course, is of Adam and Eve in the Bible. And as the story goes, Adam and Eve were created by God to live a wonderful life in the Garden of Eden. But they wanted more. They wanted to have the knowledge. They wanted to be in control. Now, if you read things about robots and AI like I do, and you can read it in the popular press as well as in academic literature, there's quite a lot of talk about a benign AI, a caring robotic future, where the robots will live with us happily and comfortably, and perhaps even look after us as we get older. But who's to say that just like the Adam and Eve story, that AI and robots will want more? And like in the 2001 film, Space Odyssey, they will refuse to do our bidding. Now, when you think about where we're at, 
um, where we're going, it's very easy to get um, frightened. And I'd like to say that, you know, listening to and thinking about what you're saying, uh, thinking now, that you're perhaps thinking that I am exaggerating. And perhaps we should just hold on a minute and pause. Because surely things aren't as bad as I've just been saying. The scary visions, for example, of a dishwashing robot, well, they've been replaced, haven't they, by a much more comforting reality. The dishwashers that you and I have in our houses. Or what about this very scary vacuum cleaning robot? Well, what's the reality? It's much calmer, isn't it? It's much more seductive and sleek. A small object that goes round our houses and cleans up after us. And Frankenstein's monster, well, the future is much nicer. What we've got is Wally. There's even a robotic pillow that you can buy. And you can hug it tight to yourself and it will gently send you off to sleep. So maybe there's nothing to worry about. But I told you, didn't I, this is a scary story. And let me tell you, the first part was not the scary part. Things are much worse than we imagined. Take a look at this guy. Look at him, he's on drugs, it seems. And he is. And indeed, we are. We're all drawn to the latest, shiniest gadget, often mobile, which we believe is going to transform our lives. And indeed, it is changing our lives. How many of you have been in situations like this with your family um, or your loved ones, where instead of looking deeply into each other's eyes, connecting empathically, you look down at the dark screen. And as you look down, what do you see? It would be lovely, wouldn't it, if it was all very positive and happy. But it's not. A lot of the things that we see as we look down are dark. There are trolls, there are echo chambers. This year in the pandemic, there's been a phenomenon called doom scrolling. It's not a hopeful, positive place. Now, let's just jump back to my past and another robot that used to scare me. This is a Cyberman from the Doctor Who series. If you don't like blood, now's the time to cover your ears because I'm going to tell you how Cybermen are created. They start off like you and I, humans. But through chainsaws and knives, their flesh is removed replaced bit by bit by cold metal. The helmet is jammed onto the head, and then the very last thing that is taken from that human is their humanity, their empathy. It's pulled out of them, and a small metallic teardrop forms at the corners of their eyes. I wonder how many of us, tap by tap, are having our humanity taken away from us, only very soon to lose that last bit of connection, our empathy. Here's a very scary um, picture, one of the most scariest, I think, of this talk. Whoa, look at that. There's only one person standing and walking purposefully, smiling, and that's Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. Everyone else, headset on, blank faces. My message tonight to all of us is not that we should be worried about the robots coming for us, but rather that we are becoming robotic. We are becoming the artificial intelligence. But it's not too late, and we can do something uh, about it. Um, we could form a movement like the Luddites did. Now, the Luddites um, are often misunderstood. 
they didn't just hate all technology. They formed a movement against harmful technology. So my message tonight is we should be thinking about how we use digital technologies for the good and in non-harmful ways. Now here's one thing that you can do straight away if you've never tried it before, and that's a digital detox. That's when you stop using your mobile phone for a day or a couple of days. Um, or you could even buy um, something like this. This is a very, very stripped down version of a mobile phone that doesn't distract you, that doesn't draw you into the digital. Maybe we could go even further though and create phones and devices which are much more attuned to what it is to be a human. So think about when you've been in the sun, for example. We're in Swansea, it's been a lovely day here, and if you spend too long in the sun, what happens? Well, you burn. Your body gives you a sing signal to get out of the heat. Or maybe right now, as you're watching this, you're eating your supper. What happens if you overeat? Well, first you'll feel full, and then it gets worse. So let's imagine building our devices that perhaps get brighter or hotter as we overuse them, or perhaps heavier and bloated as we spend too much time tapping on the screen. Now, one of the great blessings that my team and I have had over the last decade or so is to work with communities that are very different to my own. So with communities like this one in Cape Town, this is Langer, a township just outside Cape Town. Or this one, which is Daravi in Mumbai, Asia's largest slum. We work with those communities to get a fresh perspective on innovation. These communities have had much less exposure to digital technology than you or I. So to some extent, they are much more human while we are becoming robots. I want to end by sharing just one example of the work that we've done with these communities. Now, some of you at home right now might have a, an Alexa box or a Google Home, a smart speaker that you can have a conversation with. We've taken those kind of devices into the streets of the slum in Daravi. And we've discovered many, very, many fascinating new things about what we should be doing in future technological, technological development. One of the most profound things, though, connects to this book. It's a book by um, Ludwig Wittgenstein, very famous book. And what he says in that book is that if a lion could speak to you and me, then we wouldn't be able to have a meaningful conversation. Why is that? Because lions are not like us. They have a different worldview. Their context is completely different to yours and mine. You know, however much we try to make speech boxes conversational, making them more and more conversant, what we found working with people in Daravi is that we will never be able to have a meaningful conversation. Because that box, that intelligence, is not like the glorious, wonderful intelligence that you and I embody. The scary thing, though, is the only way that you will be able to have a conversation with one of those intelligences is if you become more like it. So we'll end with two images. First one, classic scary image of a robot. Oh, be afraid. Let me tell you, that is a distraction. Here is the most scary image tonight of all. I really want to reach out and call to you as an individual then as a family, and then as people who can make a difference, let us work so that our children 
and their children spend less time looking down, click by click by click, and look the world head on, so that together we can all say, we are not robots. Thank you.